Deus Volt! Welcome to the DevOps Crusade. The causes and casualties of AWS misconfigurations. Um, here's the ground that we're going to cover. Since this is a security talk, I'm going to start off with some victim shaming. And then <laughs> after that, uh, I will go into a two-ish minute rant on why I blame DevOps for security issues. And that is followed by the technical side of the talk, which nobody remembers, um, where I explain the complexities of permissions in AWS. And I will also go over some tools and tips on how to assess your, your, account, um, your account security in AWS for free, and then it will conclude with some steps on how you can lock down your AWS account. Oh, and if you happen to use a different cloud provider, please stay tuned for the end because the tips I give will be ubiquitous no matter who you choose. Tell me if you've heard this story before. A minor mistake led to a relatively massive leak. It's not the first time we've been here, has it? We've had S3 data leaks affecting millions of users every six to 12 months for the past three years. This is ridiculous, especially since companies can save billions and the millions of us who use these services and products um, can save lots of headache and misery with 17 lines of JSON. I'm talking about curly brackets, key value pairs, and key value pairs here. But I want to go over the 2019 Capital One breach. I want to emphasize that it is different. And the reason why I want to go over this one with you is because it's not the usual open S3 bucket out on the internet. The folks at Capital One weren't stupid. They, they, had it they had what they thought was locked down behind a web application firewall that, was al that also just happened to be misconfigured. The attacker was able to get through the firewall onto an EC2 instance and then connect to what I think multiple S3 buckets containing millions and customer data. My thought is why that particular EC2 instance? Why did it have that much access to S3 to download that much content? That's the question I, that's been buzzing around in my mind. And the other question is follows, what can I do to prevent this from going on in my own environment? But first, I want to blame my problems on DevOps. <laughs> I blame DevOps. I blame a company cultures that prioritize pushing features at breakneck crackhead speeds. I am, we're building things fast and they're breaking down even faster. But here's the thing, uh, the DevOps crusade, it's over. Day one, well, we are all we're all taking the DevOps Kool Aid by now. Um, all of our we're moving our infrastructure to the cloud. We're just screaming automation at the top of our lungs. We drank the DevOps Kool Aid and we're paying for it. Of course, there's another buzzword solution to buzzword problems. I hear this bounce this term bounced around a lot. DevSecOps. I don't like it. It's bulky, it's ill-elegant, and it's just throwing security in the middle of it to try to get security people on board with this. But part of me thinks to myself, you know, why stop there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're all t on the same team, right? I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Sec security isn't something that you throw into the middle of things. 
it's something that needs to be ingrained into everyday business. So the DevOps I I'm arguing for values genuine dialogue and communication between development, security, and operations. We're not talking about just throwing around code faster in automated fashion between the teams and between the silos. What I'm arguing for is that every developer be trained to understand the security and operations requirements so that they can write secure code that works. That's the, that's the vision that I want to sell to you. And part of that is enabling the developer, and as enabling developers to write that code. And in order to do that, they have to understand the complexities of S3. So what's so complicated about per access management in S3? Well, here's the details. You've got two options. And I say options in the same way that seat belts and airbags are options. Theoretically, you can use one or the other and feel relatively safe, but let's use both. The first system is IAM roles and policies. IAM has a lot to do with users and the users and entities acting on those users' behalf. The second, the second system are bucket policies and the bucket itself determines who it will open itself to for its resources. Now, I am roles, here's an example for I am roles. As a developer, I have access to source code for our ongoing projects um, for secure ideas. As a consultant with secure ideas, I also have the, I also have the ability to just spin up a cracking server password cracking server when I'm on an engagement. So I am roles are, speci are specifically associated with users or entities acting on users' behalf, and they have written statements attached to them that determine what they can do and what they can access. That's what, that's I am, it's, users, it's user or service centered. And I say service centered because AWS code pipeline has a role within itself. It's not necessarily a human, you wouldn't call it a user, but AWS code pipeline takes code from uh, any source that you give it, whether it be S3 or GitHub, run, builds the code, and then, and then deploys it to whatever, wherever you want to, uh, deploys it to wherever you want to go. So that code pipeline has to have a role that allows it to get to grab it from the source and deploy the code. It, those policies have to be written into the code in order for it to do its job and to do its function. Now for S3 bucket policies, there's a lot that we can go into, but I have to I have to cut myself off because we only have 20 minutes together. And so one thing, some things I will mention, you can lock down with a specific bucket, you can lock it down with multi-factor authentication, you can restrict the level of IP addresses that can access files on this S3 bucket, there's so much you can do. But if you understand and know IAM roles, those same principles apply to bucket policies. So, Mastering, so mastering permission structure in S3 involves mastering I, IAM roles and mastering S3 bucket policies. But insecure use is three easy clicks away. <laughs> now, this is beautiful, it's elegant, it's what we, it's probably what the CEO was sold on when you when it was brought up to move your infrastructure to AWS, it's these types of things. Uh, step one, and this is a step-by-step -step process on how do I connect, how do I access S3 through an EC2 instance. So step one, you create the IAM role. Step two, you attach the S3 full access policy this is built in, this policy gives wide open access to S3. It's 
built into every single AWS account and takes four clicks to use. Then you just set up and launch an EC2 instance. Just spin it up. You just click and through and follow the online wizard. Now we go into how the secure use, the right way, to uh, the right way to access S3 from an EC2 instance. And I'm not going to lie to you, this is complicated. But follow along with me, if you will. First, you create an IAM role. Then you create and edit uh, S custom S3 policy, which involves you learning some JSON, memorizing some of those key pa value pairs, some of the actions that you're allowed to take on Amazon S3. We attach the custom, we attach that custom policy. Then we set up and launch the EC2 instance, spin it up, and you SSH into it. You're in the box. You use the built-in AWS CLI and access denied. It doesn't work. Um, you, can't you can't change the rules of EC2 instance while it's running, so you have to tear down that EC2 instance, go back to step two, and continue this process over and over again. This secure use of the platform is difficult and tedious and requires a lot of trial and error. This is not something you just hand, you just throw at the security team while it's three months in production and say, secure this. For massive web applications that are cloud native, it could be, this is the just the interaction between two services. Regular full-blown cloud apps could have dozens of services that interact in different ways. And so this process gets exponentially more difficult the larger -er the app is and the more that you leverage Amazon Web Services. So with that said, how can we assess security on AWS resources? Well, the one tool I'm going to show and present to you today is freely available uh, for most people working on AWS it is a tool that will cost you nothing no matter how much you use it. It's not a free tool and then you get a bill for $400 next month and, and you go screaming at your DevOps guys like, what are you doing? Um, it's absolutely free and it's accessible to anyone who uses it. And with that, we switch over, so we switch over to the live demo portion. So, here's an example of here's an example of a bad as a bad um, EC2 server EC2 server tool. Oh, one second. So this is an example of a bad <laughs> S3, S3 demo rule. It only has one policy in it, and you see, note the use of wildcards. It's just four lines. Simple, elegant, beautiful, right? But if, we go into, but if we go into S3 and we actually look at all of the, select all of the options that it gives us, everything is allowed. Green means go for everyone including you, the legitimate user, and an attacker who just happens to acquire the role. So some of the, so some of the permission structure er, that you can get with full S3 access is ridiculous. You can list all the, you can do things like list all the buckets, download, um, you can delete entire buckets. If you store logs in S3 for attacks or malicious activity, Someone with full S3 access can go into the logs and erase their traces. There are, multi there are way too many things, there are way too many actions here that can be abused. So let's tone it down to something more sane. So here's an example of 
a more secure S3 policy. And now this is something, now this is the 17 lines of JSON that I'm talking about. You're keeping it sane, you're designating, you're designating one bucket, that happens to be some bucket, and the objects within that one bucket uh, you're allowed to access. And the actions that you want is the simple use case of S3. When you think of S3, you think, I want to download files, I want to upload files to some server that I don't want to manage, and I, want, I would like to refer to the server by name. So that is get, so that get object, put object, and the list bucket operation. So now when we run the, now when we apply this and run the simulation again, access denied. And this is a good thing. That means someone, that means someone who has attached and has access to this role can't really abu can't really use this particular role to abuse use it on multiple buckets on arbit an arbitrary bucket. What they can do, and we can do, and we can go into depth. I'm going to specify the object by using the ARN, by just copying the ARN. Ultimate in hand-eye coordination. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I'm also, go and I'm also going to specify the bucket by, co by copying the ARN as well. And all I'm doing is hey, let's rerun the simulation rather than st on star, wildcard, any resource here. Let's specifically designate one particular bucket or one set of objects. Here we're using wildcard thoughtfully. We're using it specifically to refer to every object or every file within that bucket rather than all buckets or all resources throughout your AWS account. Now. We rerun the simulation, and it's the same thing, right? Well, when we go into li uh, when we go to the specific permissions that we're going to, we see that these specific permissions are allowed. So you can list bucket, meaning you can refer to this bucket by name, which is kind of needed if you want to access the files. You got to at least know the fold the folder name, right? Get object, which get object, which get object, which means you can download files and put objects, which means you can create and upload files to S3. And that's the demo portion. So, with all that in mind, and all that said, ooh, wrong screen. Ooh, wrong screen. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> With that said, how do we lock down our AD, uh, how do we lock down our AWS accounts? First, we need to understand that secure DevOps requires review and analysis of the code and the cloud. What that means is is if your developers or or DevOps people or whomever is writing is writing and making this weird black magic, um, make sure that you review what they're doing, not just code wise, but also in AWS. Have those changes mentioned in the pull request, and then bake this into the process of development. You could also use cloud formation templates uh, to have the cloud infrastructure embedded into the code base. A term that gets thrown about is infrastructure as code. It's really effective to help get eyes on, on the changes that are being made. And then make sure that you actually have the reviewer check for security issues at every pull request. Number two, resources need to be isolated and given the least possible privileges. So 
One easy way to do that is just to have two separate AWS accounts. One for production, that's, that's nice, beautiful, shiny product that's available for the customers, and then the other for the half-baked works in progress. So if the devs mess up here, they're not going to expose confidential data. We understand that isolation is needed for code. It needs to also be isolated for serverless infrastructure that has a price tag attached. Also, make sure you, that you avoid, that you be suspicious and wary of wildcards and not use full access permissions. Do not allow full access permissions. Number three, understand that security patches are bug fixes. Security improvements are features, and they need to be treated as such. Have the devs use tools like the AWS Policy Simulator to debug permissions and write code securely the first time around. And please, please, for all that is sacred, do not throw your massive cloud-native application to the set team and tell them to lock it down after it's in production for three months. While the fires are, th we, there are enough fires to put out, this, this dumpster fire can be prevented. Now using all the techniques that we've discussed, we could prevent these headlines. If the attacker got access to the EC2 instance and it only served a minor role and only had access to one bucket, we wouldn't have this massive leak affecting millions of people. Secure Dev can create specific policies that save billions of dollars and save a lot of us a lot of misery. Security is a never-ending campaign in this sort of IT technology journey. We're all trying to build and create beautiful things and change the world. I believe we're all on the same side and we shouldn't be fighting against each other. Security and the concerns with that is just a never ending campaign within that journey. And so my invitation to you is let the devs join in on the action. They are eager to help you. Trust me, you should see it when you should see it when we actually teach them that they can hack their own apps. Their eyes just light up and it's just like, ah. Oh. That's my invitation. That's simply my invitation to you. So invite the devs on the journey. Let's the DevOps crusade continue. Let's retake the cloud. Deus Vault.